you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Mark chapter 8. If you don't have one, there's a Bible you can use in the pew in front of you, or it's also printed in your bulletin. Well, we all have our cross to bear, right? People usually say that when they're referring to something difficult in their lives that they have to put up with a disease, a a difficult job, a difficult relative. But when our Lord Jesus used the word cross, he meant death, and he meant it exclusively. The climax of Mark's gospel came in verses 27 to 30 when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one, the Lord and Messiah, the Son of God. Now the major emphasis in Mark shifts from the crowds and the power of Jesus displayed in miracles to the disciples And now the cross. From here to the end of chapter 10, the same sequence is going to repeat three times. Jesus predicts his death. The disciples misunderstand him. And so he teaches them about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following him. When Peter made his confession, Jesus revealed in verse 31 for the first time in Mark that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So in order for Jesus to accomplish God's salvation for sinners, the mission for which he was sent, he must die. In God's design, there was no way around this. But what Jesus also begins to reveal here is that believing in him, following him in this world means to identify with him in his suffering and in his death. We don't die for our own sins. That's not what he's calling us to do. We're not saved by our giving up our lives for Jesus. We are saved by his death for us. But one of the crucial things Jesus reveals by dying in this world is that to identify with him means doing the same. This is the means through which God has decided to make the message of life known by dying to the world. In Mark, Jesus is the crucified king and his disciples are those who die in the world and to the world with him. In other words, there's no way to follow Jesus without dying to ourselves in this world. And the context in which this comes out takes that concept out of those you know, grand and miraculous thoughts of only being able to die for Jesus by being violently martyred The context here takes it away from that because that's easy to push away and that probably won't happen to most of us and puts it right in the lap of our daily lives and the thoughts and the idols and the agendas that we cling to in our own hearts because Peter has just proven, remember, how badly damaged our vision is. We might know Jesus, but we still see people, we still see the world as though it's trees walking. So we see, remember, but we don't really see. And nowhere is our impaired vision more dangerous than in our inability to grasp what it truly means to identify ourselves with Jesus in this world. Jesus puts this teaching in the context of how we worship our own agendas. That's when he brings up the concept of dying Every day to follow Jesus is to die to our autonomy, to die to our self-sufficiency, as well as our dreams and our ambitions and our goals. Every single day, Jesus calls us to die. Beloved, that's at the essence of what it means to follow him. And I would propose to you that we are as unable to do that as we are to achieve our own salvation in the first place. We are as dependent on God's grace to produce our own death to ourselves as we are for him to have purchased our eternal salvation. Jesus calls us to lose our lives in this world, to let go of every claim we make to ourselves so that we might finally, truly live. So let's pray and we'll begin. Father, I ask that for your name, your renown, your glory in the hearts of your people and everyone that has come into this place this morning, 
I ask, Father, that you would overshadow my agendas, my flesh, and set me apart for your Holy Spirit for the task of preaching this text and this sermon. Please take over who I am for your sake and watch over everyone here. Open their ears by the power of your Holy Spirit and enable all of us to hear, to listen, to get it, to believe. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me read Mark 8, 34, and I'll actually read to chapter 9, verse 1. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now the first thing to notice in this text is what Jesus does before he begins teaching in verse 34. It's, we read over it very quickly, but it's there. Remember back in verse 27, Jesus had pulled away from the crowds at Bethsaida and began to travel to Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, teaching them specifically. But after he rebukes Peter and calls him Satan for trying to keep Jesus from dying, Jesus in verse 34 calls the crowd to him. Now, if you're trying to gather followers... Is this the thing about following you that you would make sure everybody heard and everybody heard very clearly? Jesus is saying, I want to make sure everybody hears what I'm about to say. Gather around me. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's going to turn people away. That's not going to garner more followers. Jesus does not grease the wheels beloved. We do. Jesus does it. This is a warning. This is a warning. And what he says here seems redundant on the surface. When you look at that sentence, if anyone would come after me, let him follow me. So if anyone would follow me, let him follow me. To believe in Jesus is to embrace him as our savior is to follow him somewhere. Beloved, where, where is he going? Where has he just said he's going? The cross beloved, the cross. That's what he wants Israel to know. And these people, these crowds, his disciples, if you would follow me, understand where I'm going. I'm going to die. So to follow me means to follow me to my death. Now, again, why is this the moment Jesus introduces this idea in Mark? Remember, Read the Gospels as though the order is deliberate. They're not just a collection of snapshots and stories from the life of Jesus. They're compiled deliberately the way they are by each author to paint a specific portrait of the life and ministry and purpose of Jesus. And here, what has just happened in verses 1 through 33? Jesus revealed that by healing a blind man in stages, which he didn't have to do, that those who follow him are going to continue to require his ongoing touch in order to see clearly. They're going to keep needing the touch of Jesus to see as clearly as he sees. Through this teaching, at least Peter among the disciples comes to understand by a supernatural act of God on his mind, remember, that this one he's been following, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God, the Messiah. He confesses this. Once Jesus' identity is clear, he begins to teach them of his purpose in verse 31, that God's, God's Messiah must suffer and be killed. And by the way, this was not a brand new idea that Jesus brought. The idea that God's servant would suffer is in the Old Testament. It's in texts like Isaiah 53, but Israel hasn't paid attention apparently to those texts or interprets them to mean perhaps their suffering at the hands of others, but not the Messiah. Jesus teaches this plainly, the text says, not in a parable. And Peter, who had just made his great confession of faith about the identity of Jesus, rebukes Jesus, pulls him aside 
and rebukes him. And to make matters worse, the word that is translated as rebuke in verse 32 is used biblically in connection with the denunciation and condemnation of demons from hell. This is the same word Jesus used to silence demons. He rebuked them, judging them to be worthy of condemnation. So Peter didn't gently take Jesus aside and mildly protest what he had said. This is a hostile rebuke to Jesus on the part of Peter. In Matthew 16, we read that Peter specifically said to him, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. You're not going to die. You're not going to be crucified. So even though God has declared it must happen, Peter steps in and says, no, 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 it must not happen. So in verse 33, Jesus rebukes Peter because with that statement, it's clear he set his mind on the things of man, not on the things of God. That's specifically why Jesus calls him Satan, for that is what the evil one does. It may be in Jesus' mind that there's a direct correlation here to Peter trying to get him to bypass the cross to become glorious, just as Satan attempted him in the wilderness to fake his way or take the easy way around his coming death, bow down and worship Satan, and there, thereby, right, gain the kingdoms of this world. Peter sounded like that to Jesus. And Jesus has already stood his ground in that temptation from Satan. So now he gathers the crowd to him because he knows what Peter has just expressed is what rests in the hearts of all people. Beloved, verses 34 and following reveal why Peter said what he said. Jesus is identifying the true desires of Peter's heart that were revealed when he tried to rebuke Jesus. What was being revealed by Peter is that what he wanted Jesus to be for him would not permit Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus reveals that even those who desire to follow him don't want to follow a savior really who dies in this world. We want a savior who conquers. We want a savior who makes our enemies look like fools. We want a savior who puts us at the top of the food chain, who uses his great power to fulfill all our desires and bring us front and center. That's what we want Jesus to be. And beloved, remember, remember this this morning as the people sitting here in this room. Hearts that are hardened to Jesus will not hear what Jesus is saying or what I'm saying through this sermon if the Holy Spirit gives me grace properly. You can't hear Jesus's word properly if your heart is hard and or hardening to him. It's impossible. We'll understand the concept of what I'm saying. We've heard this text probably hundreds of times. We'll see people like the blind man in the early part of chapter eight, but they'll look like trees walking. So if there's a desire in your heart right now in this moment to truly follow Jesus and truly be identified with him, ask him in your heart right now to touch your eyes with his word right in this very moment, right in this sermon. Because Jesus isn't playing around here. This is the life grace gives to us, to die to ourselves in this world, which mainly means dying to our own personal desires for what we want Jesus to be that are not in accordance with his will and his purpose. So I'm going to say this here as plainly as I can. Jesus did not come to make America great. Jesus did not come to secure your first or your second amendment rights. Jesus did not come to condone our sexual desires and celebrate whatever claims we decide to make about ourselves. Jesus did not come to make sure our sinfulness is celebrated by everybody. Jesus did not come to prioritize what we prioritize. Jesus came to die precisely because we think like that of him. We only think of our sin in terms of the bad things we do and maybe the bad thoughts we have. Jesus would call our sin idolatry anytime we aren't asking or desiring of him what he actually came to do in our world. We are in double trouble. Beloved, he came to die for us because we're so corrupted by our own sinfulness and our own agendas and our own autonomy 
that we will actually question whether he's worth following unless he's going to employ his great power to give us what we desire and fulfill our dreams and our ambitions and our hopes. We never think of having to die to even the good things we want for the sake of Jesus, right? And Jesus wants it crystal clear. If you would come after me, you must deny yourself. Deny yourself everything you want and everything you want from me that isn't why I came and take up your cross because that's what it's going to be to die to those things, my cross. Take that up and follow me and I'm going to go crucify it. Beloved, we must die to everything we want in this world that isn't Jesus. Even the good things that aren't sinful. To die to things means not trying to draw any life from them, not trying to draw any meaning and any fulfillment from them, but to draw life only, exclusively from Jesus and all that he is for us. Beloved, this is the only way to walk as Jesus walked when we hear that commanded of us in 1 John. Our neighbors, much less our enemies, will never be loved and served selflessly until we are no longer trying to draw life and meaning and fulfillment from other people and other things. Other people like our spouses and our friends and our families and other things like America and money and stability. All of this must be died to. All of it. Peter heard Jesus say he was going to be rejected and killed. That didn't fit with Peter's agenda for Jesus. What Peter wanted Jesus to be. Jesus needed to end the Roman occupation of Israel. That's what Jesus needed to do. Jesus needed to make Israel great again. He needed to make mega hats and have everybody wearing them and wearing them around and saying that again and again. And Jesus was going to take all disease away and all sickness away and all problems away. But if he gets killed by the leaders of Israel, all those hopes are dashed. And if he gets rejected and killed by the leaders of Israel, the leaders of Israel are probably going to come for the people that follow him next. So Jesus, no, you can't do this. No. We almost want to laugh at Peter's foolishness there, but what is in our own hearts? What is in our own hearts? We, we, we like to try to justify our need for other saviors by thinking that we don't worship them. We just like them, right? How do you worship? How do you worship God? Well, you tell him how great he is. You tell him how much you love him. You sing songs to him. You think of him. You meditate on him. You reflect on how glorious he is. It's exactly what we do with everything else in our lives, beloved. So how are we exclusively worshiping Jesus? Right? What desires of ours are we secretly frustrated at Jesus for not fulfilling? What desires of ours is Jesus not giving us that are making us question whether or not he loves us? Why do you like Jesus? I'm not asking you why you love him. I'm asking you why you like him. Why you want him on your team. And would you still follow him if it became clear that he's not about fulfilling your agenda in this world, but his own, which is against every other agenda in the world. So when we talk about our need to be saved, oh, beloved, it's not just from sin and the evil one in the world, absolutely, but it is most certainly and maybe most urgently from ourselves. We don't have any clue how badly we need salvation, beloved, of just how much we need saved from, right? We come to Jesus thinking there's compartments of our life that are pleasing to him and good and right, so we don't need to give up those things. Those things don't need to be conformed to his purpose. Beloved, death is death. A cross is something you're killed on, right? It's, it's excruciating. It's not a difficult Monday. To follow Jesus, the, the, it's not just our sinful thoughts and actions that are evil. Right? It's, it's how we refuse to die to ourselves. And when we say that, look, 
It doesn't, when Jesus talks about self-denial, he's actually talking about preservation. So we got to think through this correctly. This doesn't really mean self-denial as we think of it. Like, you know what? I'm going to give up pizza or chocolate for the next 40 days because it's Lent. And on Friday, I'm not going to eat meat or I'm going to do this. I'm not going to go to this place anywhere. I'm not, that, that's not the self-denial Jesus is talking about. This is a dying that lets go of everything, including what we want Jesus to do that isn't in his agenda. To follow Jesus means dying to everything we want from this world. And let's be honest. We've heard this text hundreds of times. We've heard it in revivals. It's probably brought some of us to the altar. I want to ask you a question. Can you do this? Can you die like this? I can't. I can't. You know what Jesus is commanding here, requiring here? And if we can't do this, if we can't do what he's commanding, we have to do what? We have to drop to our knees, admit that in him alone is my only hope for life and salvation. I cannot do what you require. I can't die every day like this. I'm pursuing my own agendas five minutes after I get out of bed if I make it that long. See, we always take it as a challenge. It's not a challenge. It's a hammer to destroy us so that we might finally believe in Jesus as our only hope of salvation. We, we, we take this text and we just run it through the ringer of what we determine to be compromises or, or, or uh, sacrifices, right? And Jesus is talking about dying, right? Dying. Look at 35. Four, so notice this. Four is an argument word. It's telling you why he said what he just said. There are like four or five of them here. He's just building on this. Look at 35. Four, because whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For his sake and the gospels, we must die to ourselves. Four, because... What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? I wonder if some of us would be perfectly fine, and I really want you to think about this, perfectly fine with Jesus giving us the whole world and then disappearing. I mean, if, if just, just don't answer out loud. Just think in your own heart. If, if, if you could have Jesus fulfill all your desires, all of them, give you everything you want that isn't sinful, but fulfill all your desires, everything you want that isn't sinful, and not just for you, but for everybody you love and care about, and you could have it, and they could have that forever, and you wouldn't have to give up any of your good dreams or desires, but he wasn't going to be there, would it matter to you, or would you be fine like that? This is what he's talking about. Dying. Death. There's no way to want to save our lives in this world and live. It won't happen. There's no way to save our lives in this world and follow Jesus and be faithful to the gospel at the same time. Jesus demands full allegiance. And I'm not here this morning to get you to come up to the front and give your full allegiance. It's a waste of time. I'm asking you to let this text rend your heart until you end up at the feet of Jesus, begging for mercy to be used by him. That's it. Our promises are worth nothing, beloved. If our good intentions were good enough, Jesus died for nothing. What Peter has just revealed is that we can have spiritual insight from above to know who Jesus is and still not be aligned with God's purpose in this world. That's what Peter has just shown. In the space of a few verses, he confesses that Jesus is Lord and then rebukes him before a few minutes have passed. This message is not just then. 
for those lost in the ongoing pursuit of their own sinful desires, rejecting Jesus and rejecting his call to repentance. This is just as much for those that think they see because at some point in their life they've made the right confession and they're actually following Jesus, at least because partly they hope that he will reward them with all the good things they want. Beloved, Jesus died in this world. He died. He lost his life here. Jesus never sinned and he died here. So apparently death is not only the destiny of every person that has ever lived because of sin and the curse. Death is apparently all this world has to offer to anybody, including the one who never sinned or did anything worthy of death and judgment. So we ought to get rid of our ideas that by doing good and being good and impressing God and making him proud, we're going to save our lives and then he'll turn everything the way we want it to be and give us the world. Beloved, what would it profit you to gain the whole world if you lost your own soul? And the way Jesus is talking here is that these are our options, die or lose our souls. Of how much worth is a soul? Apparently, the whole world can't pay for it. Only the blood of Jesus who died can ransom a soul. Death is the only way. It's the only way. And look at verse 37. For what can a man give in return for his soul? So notice what he's doing. He's saying, once you've lost your soul, how in the world do you figure you can get it back? What could you give in return for the soul you gave up to gain the world? How are you going to get it back? Beloved, the human soul, the very essence of who we are then, is in the hand of God. Notice the connection Jesus makes here in verse 38 by using that word for again at the end of verse 37. For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. That comes on the heels of Peter saying who he was. So we need to redefine what it means to be ashamed of Jesus in light of this text. Peter wasn't ashamed to say who the Lord was. That's not what he's talking about. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So being ashamed is not just doing a headache prayer before you eat, like in the lunchroom at school, right? Or in McDonald's, because you don't want anybody to know you're praying, so you do one of these. Dear Lord, I pray that bless this food to my body and everything. Amen. Right? You ever do one of those? That's my high school prayer right there. <laughs> Being ashamed is not just declining to admit in public or around friends or strangers that you follow Jesus. That, that Being ashamed is is really something more than that. Being ashamed is the attitude of our hearts that has us following Jesus because we want him to fulfill our earthly desires as though who he actually is and what he actually requires is not something we're willing to identify with. What is Peter ashamed of here? Who Jesus is? No, no, no. Peter's ashamed of his death. Peter's ashamed of the fact that Jesus, his Lord, his Messiah, the one he confesses is going to die. Right? That's what he's ashamed of. We're ashamed of the fact that to follow Jesus is to die to ourselves, not to realize ourselves. We don't want to be hated by the world. We don't want to lose everything. We don't want to be like Jesus in that, really. We only want to be like him maybe in the morality that makes us so impressive to others. We wouldn't mind having his power, but we don't really want his ability to take a nail, right? Beloved, we don't want to be inconvenienced, let alone die every day. Notice that. We know that the death Jesus is talking about here is metaphorical and not literal because in this same conversation in what Luke includes in Luke 9, Jesus says to take up your cross daily. Daily. You can't literally die every day. So this is a metaphorical dying but it's a real dying nonetheless. So to take up your cross is not simply to accept any kind of hardship. An unbeliever could use that phrase and be talking about the same kind of thing. I, we all have our cross to bear. I have this difficult thing I have to deal with in my life. Jesus isn't talking about those things. 
He's talking about dying. It's to subject oneself to shameful and excruciating execution by crucifixion. Jesus called the crowds to him to tell them this. Who wants to do that? Who wants to do that? We like to find ways that we're more serious about our Christian faith than other Christians are, right? So we're constantly measuring other Christians. They're not as committed as we are, not as sold out as we are, not as serious as we are maybe. And look, I'm not, you, you may be much more serious about your daily walk than other Christians are, but are you dying? Are you dead yet? Don't worry about going beyond the standards of your brothers and sisters and other people. That doesn't mean anything. Ask yourself if you truly meet the standard of Jesus. And when you're ready to answer that question honestly, then we're ready to follow him. This isn't a challenge. This is a pronouncement of doom that is meant to drive us to the feet of Jesus begging for salvation because what he reveals here is that it's going to take a lot more than we think it is for our souls to be saved. Again, Jesus not only died to forgive us of our sins, but to grant us his perfectly obedient righteousness. He's doing both at the cross. It's not like Jesus just wipes your slate clean and then you write the story. Jesus wipes your slate clean and replaces your iniquity and your inability with his righteousness and his endurance and his faithfulness and his protection. That's how we make it home. That's how we make it home. Jesus has paid for everything. He owns your life now. We have not been given the days and hours and minutes and years of our own individual lives to somehow figure out how to twist God's arm to make this a better life. Beloved, the you that was born, you believers I'm talking to, the you that was born on your birthday, that person is dead. They're gone. The you that's in this room right now has been born again. There's a new life there. That's what has happened to us. We're trying to co-op the two lives, right? We all are, from the pulpit to the pew. We're trying to figure out a way to live in this world. That's how we read our Christianity. And Jesus calls us to die in this world. To die. To identify with Jesus is to become the walking dead in this world. Jesus proves that's the only way to actually love people. It is to give up all attempts to hang on to and preserve our lives in order that God's will in Jesus might be made known to our neighbors, our loved ones, our families, our friends, and our enemies and all the nations. Only until we're not trying to use people and use things for our own personal gain are we truly following Jesus as Jesus would define following him. And yet we're so angry, aren't we, at sinners for being sinners. We don't want to evangelize them. We can't stand them. We don't even want to be near them. We just want to belittle them into submission. There's no love for lost people. There's no love for protesters and rioters, right? There's no love for liberals and homosexuals. We can't stand them, right? They gross us out. We hate them. And we all know that we're Pharisees because we like to play these word games. Right? Well, I don't want to condone sin. Loving someone even while they're sinners is not evil. It's not condoning anything. It's the essence of Christ's likeness. You remember the scripture. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
He died for me while I was in the process of rebelling against him. How can we who are also sinners then not love sinners? Why are we so disgusted by them? Why am I a believer and they're not? Because God did to me what he did to Peter and he hasn't done it to them yet. I can't take credit for anything. What am I bragging about? What am I straightening up my chest for? Why do I want people to think I'm the hero? Why? And then we're amazed when we let them down and they don't want anything to do with us. Beloved, would you give your life for someone who is actively sinning against you in that moment? Would you? If somebody put a gun to your head and is about to kill you, would you forgive them for it in the moment? That's what Jesus did. I'm not telling you that's what I do. I don't know what I do. All I know is I'm going to need 100 proof grace in that moment or I'm not going to do the right thing. And I don't know what the right thing is in that situation. I'm simply saying, could you give your life for somebody who was actively sinning against you in the moment of them doing it? Because Jesus did it for more than the grains of sand that are on the seashore and more stars than there are in the entire cosmos, beloved. You, do, you, do you see? Jesus doesn't think we can do this. That's why he's saying it. Because we need pushed to the edge before we really realize how much we need to be saved. We don't just need to be saved from our sins. We need to be saved from what we do that we think is righteous. I need saved from the tip of my toes to the top of my head. There isn't an ounce of me, not an ounce of me, that is worthy of salvation, not an ounce of me. We just, beloved, we, we can't cover our disdain for sinners by trying to sound holy about it. And why am I talking about this? Because this is what Jesus is talking about. Why was he dying? Why was he going to the cross? Who was he doing it for? Why is that what controlled his life? Why was it a must, like he says? I just don't want to look like we condone sin, so I don't want to be welcoming and kind to such people. We can't let such people in our church. Where would you let them then? I'm not talking about condoning anybody's sin or changing what the Bible calls sin. We're not talking about that. It's a straw man argument. Just know, if, if that's how you think, you would have been in the crowd calling Jesus a compromiser and a tax collector and a drunkard and a glutton. Just remember that. Those are questions Pharisees ask. Are we sure we can have them? I mean, they're, they're sinners. Yeah, we're not going to condone their sin. But if they're not welcome here, beloved, are we in the way of Jesus? Lord, soften our hearts. I'm, I'm too worthy of judgment myself to celebrate anybody else getting it. Lord, open the doors of our church to the lost. And if people want to get in the way of it, move them out of the way. Tell Satan to get behind us, Lord, that we might be your people. Beloved, we must renounce every claim to ourselves and follow Jesus to our deaths if that's what it's going to mean in this world. And it may. It may mean literal death in our lifetimes. It may not. I don't know. But Jesus doesn't make any qualifications. He's not saying, now, of course, I'm only talking about if you live in a hostile nation. This is for anyone. If anyone would come after me, right? So Jesus assumes that following him is the same whether you live in North Korea or America. Do you see that? It's just different things you have to die to, beloved. That's the only difference. It's the only difference. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, Romans 8. 17.
To be a child and an heir is to be a sufferer, beloved. Jesus isn't teaching advanced Christianity here in Mark 8. This is Christianity 101. My cross is my inability to see him clearly. It's killing me. My cross is my unwillingness to die to my desires both for me and for who I want Jesus to be in this world. I drag this around with me in my flesh and in my pride and in my iniquity every single day. And Jesus is saying, you come with me and get that crucified or you can't follow me. It's to that, beloved, that we must die. Jesus says every single day in Luke 9, 23. Why? Why every single day? Because he knows these desires are going to be there every single day. There's no one-time promise at church camp because you got the feelings going with the music and all the kids crying and, Lord, I'll follow you. That usually lasts until oh, you get home. Right? That, that, that's not the dying Jesus is talking about. You don't check that box on a card. I would die to myself today. No, you, every single day. And so, again, what is Jesus doing? You start to think of what he's actually requiring. And you realize, like, like when he told the Pharisees, he wasn't playing around that you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How am I going to get that? There's one way I'm going to get that. Tony Romano, born on August 16th, 1975, he dies. And Jesus creates a new one in his place that's forgiven of all his sin and has all of his righteousness credited to his account. That's how. And apparently, believing that, being conformed to that is so hard, it will take my daily dying to myself to follow Jesus in this world. Jesus doesn't conceive of a Christianity that isn't following him. Which, which would be aligning yourself with his footsteps. Where did he go? Where could he be found? Where did he walk? Where did he travel? Why did he go? That's what it means to follow him. We're talking precisely about our concern for the lost when we're talking about following Jesus. That's everywhere he went. I will need Jesus to touch my eyes every single day if I'm going to be able to see anything he wants me to. That's what's happening in chapter 8. Chapter 9, verse 1, And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. By the way, just quickly, this is one of the most difficult statements in the four Gospels because it seems to indicate that Jesus will return in glory, verse 38, before the death of the disciples. We know that's not what happened. So what do we make of this? There are a few ways to interpret this statement and we can agree to disagree on it. I, I think it's connected to what he's just said in verse 38. Sometimes, remember the chapter and verse numbers and divisions are man-made. So sometimes chapter divisions cloud a text. What we know as 9-1 I think should be 839. But elsewhere, like in chapter 13, verse 22 of Mark, Jesus denies having specific knowledge of the time of the end. So I don't think he'd be predicting it here right? I believe Jesus is referring to his transfiguration, which is about to take place in Mark 9, 2 to 13, as a preview and a guarantee of his return one day in power and glory. But when he says, even further, when he says some of the disciples will not die before witnessing that event, what could he mean since they're all dead and it hasn't happened yet? I think, again, he's contrasting the three disciples who would actually see it, because remember, not all of them were going to see that preview. He's contrasting the three who would actually see it, the preview of his power in the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, with those who would not see it until the final resurrection when it does come in full power and glory. Those three disciples were about to have a very unique experience. But, beloved, here's the important thing. Jesus is teaching that we will all taste death in one way or another before he returns in glory. Some of us may physically die before his second coming, but we all must die spiritually. That's what Jesus has called us to. But here's the thing. All this talk about death, beloved, make sure you hear every word of your Savior in this moment. Because the Christ who was crucified is also the Christ who was raised on the third day. So the call of Jesus to die is his invitation to you and I to live. 
Beloved, Jesus isn't calling us to lose our lives. Do you notice this? He's actually calling us to gain our lives. Do you see that in the text? If you just stop at the principle of self-denial, you miss it. This is an invitation not to lose your life, but to gain it, to keep it. You want to live, don't you? Jesus is the only one taking that desire seriously. He's the only one who grants life. On the lips of Jesus who was crucified and rose again for us, the call to die is the call to actually live. So Jesus calls us to lose our lives in this world, to let go of every claim we make to ourselves so that we might truly live. That's what he's inviting us to. The life you want, the life of your agendas and desires, that's death. You're going to die pursuing that life. Jesus is saying, don't die. Don't lose your life. Live. Come to me. All this world has for us is death. This thing called life is only in Jesus. He's just calling us away from doom when he's calling us to die to ourselves in this world. Who is happy in this pursuit of themselves? Who's gained all they wanted? Who's fine? Who can just take a break and quit because they've got it all? No regrets. No wishes left unfulfilled. It never stops. It never stops. Jesus is the end of this life. And don't just think of it in terms of specific actions or a lifestyle of, you know, intermediate self-denial. Think of this in terms of dying to our own desires for what we want Jesus to do and surrendering to his will. When you're upset with him for not fulfilling desires, it's very hard to proclaim him to people that need him. Right? The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you want to know where the Son of Man is, he'd be eating and drinking. Right? He'd not be being served somewhere. He'd be serving, giving his life as a ransom for many. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Not that our blood's going to save anybody. But in our dying, they're meant to see the one who can. My dying to me is to identify with him in that mission. That's what it means. It may be the literal reason for my physical death. It may not. But to follow Jesus means to live with a posture that leans into dying, not that tries to avoid it. But Jesus isn't even really speaking, remember, of our physical deaths here. That's what we have to keep in mind. If we just make this about dying in martyrdom, we can push it out and it might never happen. And it's not very immediate for us anyway. Jesus is talking about a daily dying. His words assume a daily desire within us then to keep these lives, to save these lives, or he wouldn't tell us to die every day. He thinks it's there. Whether or not you and I think it's there or perceive it makes no difference. Jesus says it will be there every day. So I'll need to die to it every day. Our desire to save our lives and to keep them comes out in our dreams and our desires and our motivations and our goals. And again, it's not that they in and of themselves are all sinful and wrong or that you can't even do any of them. It's dying to anything we hope to get from them that only Jesus can give. What we're learning here is that Jesus can only be truly understood then in terms of his suffering. Right? We are often so perplexed as his disciples because we're trying to use Jesus for life in this world. And Jesus came for my death to this world. I lean into Jesus to die here, not to survive here. Right? Jesus died to save sinners. God's desire to save the lost shaped the daily life of Jesus to the point that when it came time to set his face toward Jerusalem where he would be killed, that's precisely what he did because he lived under the divine must right? This is an abstract. Apparently, the thing about Jesus that's so hard to identify with every single day for me is that he lived his life every day to save other people. And the desires and agendas of our own hearts so conflict with this that we can't identify with him in that unless he keeps touching our eyes with his word so that we might see as he saw. Again, this death to self is not to save ourselves. It's to identify with his agenda. 
And beloved, take heart. Because if you have to do this over and over and over again every day, guess what? He's promised to be with you in that. It's an amazing thing. Jesus expects that you will love yourself every day. So he died for you. The ransom for our clinging to self every day has been paid. Don't live like it's still on the table to be paid for. Right? Don't. This is not a challenge to live a certain kind of life, like a, like a life that we decide what the dying is. This is a very specific thing to love sinners so much that you might die doing it, right? It's, 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 it's not, it doesn't mean foregoing caffeine, right? Or putting up with your difficult relative. It's Jesus' pronouncement that if we want to follow him, he's going to have to be our legs. The demand of Jesus is too high and too holy for us to follow. And it shows us just how corrupt we are that we can't because all he came to earth to do was glorify his father by pursuing and saving the lost. Well, Jesus, don't you want to do more than that? Really? Don't you want to do more than that? Don't you want to kick out the Romans for us? Don't you want to make sure the socialists don't take over? God, are you sure that that's the agenda? Jesus would say, no, you leave that to God. Vengeance is mine. The Lord will repay. You don't worry about that. You see that tax collector over there? He needs my forgiveness. You see that prostitute over there? She needs my forgiveness. You see that adulterous woman? She needs my protection. You see that young person struggling with their sexuality at a young age? They need me. You see that mother that thought abortion was the only way out? She needs me. You're here. Go to her. Go to her. And Jesus says that, living like that, is a death to self. We want Jesus to eradicate these people. Right? That's what we want. Don't, we're not above the Pharisees. We're not above them. We need this forgiveness. We need this cleansing. We need this salvation. To follow Jesus is simply to spread the wealth of his grace, beloved. We, we've, that's why he gave us so much. That's why he lavishes it on us in 2 Corinthians 9, so that we're equipped for every good work he would have us do. He's loaded us down with grace, which is the most freeing weight in the world. So give it away. He's got more. We need him to come and do for us what he did for Peter. We need him to open our eyes so that we can see. I don't mean we need to be saved again and again. That's, I, I mean that even as his disciples, we need his healing touch on our eyes every single day to follow him. Every single day. So let's let the demand of Jesus do what it needs to do to us. We all know we're not meeting this standard. We all know we've not yet fully died to ourselves. And now we know that Jesus requires that of us every day. He wants us to identify with him in his suffering and his death, which was demonstrated mainly by his unquenchable love for and pursuit of the lost that was the motivation for his life, and that drove him to his death, which means it must be the same for us. And we cannot work up the will or the commitment or the ability to do this. We need Jesus to shine his light on us. He has designed the reality of following him as impossible so that even as his disciples, we would never think that we don't need the exact same amount of grace as the people to whom we're called to proclaim that grace. We need his forgiveness and his grace and his direction and his power as his church. And beloved, all of this has been promised to us. All of it. So Christian, come to Jesus, follow him. And you who don't believe, realize what all this Jesus talk means for you. That the Savior we, yes, imperfectly worship is yours for the taking too. Yes, he calls us to die, but so that we might live for eternity. It's a good trade. And when this is over, he will welcome us in his arms. This is Jesus and beloved he is for you. Come and follow.